Hello YouTube, I know you're all thinking to yourself, what am I going to do today? I have an excellent idea. Let's learn about biochemistry. Let's learn about bases. Let's learn about nucleotides. Let's learn about DNA. Alright, so let's start off here. Let's start with bases. What is a base? Well, there's four main bases in DNA. There's four main bases in RNA. Three of them overlap. And then there's a couple that are on the fence. So let's talk about the ones uh, four main DNA bases. It's going to be adenine, guanine, cytosine, and finally thymine. What do we have here? Well, I drew out the structure. Um, I only drew it out simply so you can see that there are similarities between these. Adenine, guanine, look at their structure. We've got two rings, two rings with a couple different groups attached to them, but for the most part, it's two rings. They're very similar. These are called the purines. Purines. Adenine, guanine, purines. Two ring structures. They're going to be the larger structures. Two large rings, purines. So we've got then these other three, these are going to be called pyrimidines. Pyrimidines. So as you can tell, while we had two rings up here, the, py the pyrimidines are going to be single ring structures with slight variations in them uh, as usual. So we've got cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil. So thymine is going to be found in DNA, and uracil is going to be found in RNA. Uh, that's a major point. So if we're looking at a strand of DNA, we're going to see thymines, and if we're looking at a strand of RNA, we're going to see uracils. Uh, so these two are interchangeable. So bases, typically on a DNA strand, you'll see it written as either an A, a T, a C, or a G. And then also in an MR or an uh, RNA strand, you would see A, U, C, and G. So just notice here that these two change when you go from DNA to RNA. So when DNA, the A stands for adenine, T for thymine. Uh, C for cytosine, and G for guan. All right, so those are the bases. Now let's talk about bases plus something else. So what happens if we have this molecule, which uh, some of you out there are noticing, well, we have one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, and a fifth carbon up there. It's a five carbon structure. And for those of you who are unaware about biochemistry structures and organic chemistry structures, uh, we're looking at each time uh, in our main kind of circular molecule here, we have a point that's going to indicate a carbon is there. So that's why I numbered one, two, three, four, five. We have five carbons in this molecule. What is this? Some of you out there already know what it is. This is a ribose. So it's going to be a sugar. It's going to be a carbohydrate. We see a lot of C's. We see a lot of H's. We see a lot of O's. That's going to be a carbohydrate. And specifically a carbohydrate, it's going to be a ribose. So what happens when we have a ribose plus a base? So we already just talked about bases. If we add one of these ring-like structures over here, if we add a purine or a cytosine onto this ribose, it'll give us a nucleoside, a nucleoside with an S. However, if we add on a ribose plus a phosphate, and just for a simple nomenclature, I write my phosphates with a P with a little circle around them. This is what a real phosphate would look like plus a base. That will give us something called a nucleotide. A nucleotide, T for tri, I like to think of it. There's three components, tri components, three components, ribose phosphate, and a base. And the nucleotide is really going to be our basic building block for DNA. Nucleosides uh, are building blocks, but we need to throw a phosphate in. Once we throw a phosphate, once we have these three Legos or three building blocks, we're able to actually make a molecule of DNA. So the base can either be, since we're talking about DNA, not RNA, since we're talking about DNA, we can have uh, a C, G, or T, since we're DNA. All right, so that's a nucleotide. 
we've got a ribose sugar, we've got a phosphate, and we've got a base. We are ready to begin, but not quite. So, let's talk about hydrogen bonds really quick. Well, we all know that DNA is in a double helix form, and they've got two strands of DNA that are facing each other. They kind of twist around in a helix form, but right now we kind of spread them out and they're just facing each other. And we, you sometimes see like a little ladder. Well, that ladder is going to be two bases. So we've got a base there, and a base there, and a base there, and a base there. And they're, they're bonding with each other. They're connecting with each other. They don't actually fuse together. They're two separate molecules because we all know that we can pull DNA apart and just use one of these strands but instead they form little bonds to each other. So that's why we kind of give it a little ladder-like structure. And those bonds are hydrogen bonds. They're not covalent bonds, they're not ionic, they are covalent, or they are hydrogen bonds, not covalent. So those bonds, well, like I said, we have here two bases that are on opposite sides of each other forming hydrogen bonds. The A's always bind with T's, and the C's always bind with G's. So over here, the A's always bind with T's. So we have a two ring structure binding with a one ring structure. And the C's always bind with G's. So we know that a two ring structure always binds with a one ring structure. So that being said, we know that one ring structure, the pyrimidines, plus a two ring structure, which is the purines, will form these hydrogen bonds. So, written a different way, pyrimidine plus purine is equal to hydrogen bond. Like I said, the A's always bind with T's, the C's always with G's. Major concept to remember. Also, I can talk about that in case if we're talking about mRNA, so RNA, uh, the T's would be replaced with U's, so A's are always going to be U's now. So if we see the U, we're talking RNA. If we see the T, we're talking DNA. So let's draw in these hydrogen bonds. Uh, I wrote bonds plural because we know that they have different number of bonds formed between uh, a cytosine and a guanine and an adenine and a thymine. So let's talk about this. An A and a T or likewise an A and a U, are always going to have two hydrogen bonds. Meanwhile, the C and the G will have three hydrogen bonds between them. So we know that two and three. So if I give you a question that says, you have a whole bunch of bases lined up here, and you have CG, 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 CG. A lot of CGs interacting with each other. You know that you have a lot of bonds there. That DNA is going to be glued together very tightly. If you have a lot of CGs, your DNA will be very bound to each other. The two different strands will be very close to each other. So it would have a higher melting point or a higher annealing point at which you could have to pull it apart. However, if you had an AT structure, so if these were all ATs, 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 a lot of ATs in a row, it'd be a lot easier to pull it apart. There's less hydrogen bonds to break to pull apart that DNA strands. C and G has three, A and T has two. Next, we'll move on. So we've kind of talked about the basic bases, the things that actually change in the DNA. Next, we moved on to our nucleoside, and finally our nucleotide, and this is our really uh, building block for DNA. Now let's put those building blocks together. Let's build some. Let's build a DNA. Here's the basic structure of DNA. Um, we have a, and, and RNA, uh, interchangeably. We have a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, backbone. Our backbone is going to be a phosphate sugar backbone. And that sugar specifically is going to be a ribose. So let's deoxyribonucleic acid ribonucleic acid, ribonucleic acid, ribose sugar. That's where the deoxyribonucleic acid 
comes in. So um, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, backbone. Next, attached to each sugar, this is going to be a base. So we get our choosing. We can choose from any four of these bases if we're talking about DNA, or any four of these bases if we're talking about RNA. So the base can change. But we would also have a strand over here facing it, and we'd have a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. And attached to each of these sugars would be a different complementary base. So let's say that this base, we are going to choose A. Attached to this sugar will be an A base. However, this opposite strand, we know, will have a T base attached to the sugar because A's always match with T's. A's always match with T's, and you have two hydrogen bonds between them. So now we can choose a different base over here, a C. We know that it'll always match up with a G. C's always with G's. It'll have three hydrogen bonds between them. So this is the basic structure of DNA. All right, now we're into the not so basic structure of DNA. This is where it gets a little confusing. I do want to leave here, I want to emphasize phosphate group, phosphate group, phosphate group. Nothing's changing. We have a ribose sugar, a ribose sugar. We're just drawing the structure out now to explain what's going on. So we've got a phosphate attached to a ribose, a phosphate attached to a ribose, a phosphate, and so on. We've also, like we said, we've got a base attached to that sugar. A base is attached to that sugar. I didn't draw it out because it would get a little, a little messy, um, but again, we've covered the structure of bases. Just use your imagination. That structure is now over here. And then what else do we have? Uh, we have positioning. Like I counted over here, we have a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, and a 5 carbon. I'm going to draw it over here. We have a 1 carbon, a 2 carbon, a 3 carbon, a 4 carbon, and the fifth one up here. So our first carbon, our second carbon, third, fourth, and fifth. So each of these sugars is going to have five carbon groups. And they're numbered accordingly. The first carbon is always going to be attached to the base. Second carbon, third carbon, fourth, fifth. So when I say DNA is a five prime end and a three prime end, you may have also heard DNA is always synthesized from three to five prime, or five prime to three prime for uh, other mechanisms. What we're talking about is going to be the five carbon and the three carbon. So when I say a five prime end, I'm talking about this end of the DNA, because that five prime end is going to be the very end. However, if I was talking about this end of the, of the DNA, I'm going to number my carbons again. One, two, right there, three, four, and five. This would be the three prime end, because look at where the three is. Look at where our end of the DNA molecule is. Our three prime is the very end. Our five prime is still attached to a phosphate over here. We're kind of trapped. Our three prime end is going to be the free end. So when you hear five prime end of DNA and three prime end of DNA, uh, this, is, this is actually what they're talking about, is that fifth position carbon is on the outside versus the third position carbon is on the outside. Then, uh, then I'd like to point out uh, bases. Bases always face inwards towards each other. And again, we'd have another complementary backbone of phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, with a base that matches. And they'd hydrogen bond with each other, complementary, of course. And this is the expanded view of DNA. So we've gone from the bases. We've gone from nucleosides and nucleotides, which are going to be our building blocks. And each one of these building blocks, a ribose phosphate base, is going to be a ribose phosphate base. Ribose phosphate base. So we just have nucleotide, nucleotide, if we continue to be nucleotide, nucleotide, building blocks. It's simple. DNA is simple. DNA is awesome. This, this shows how complex our body is.
get how simple, using simple building blocks, we can create a DNA structure. Thank you for paying attention, and if you have any questions, be sure to ask. Otherwise, like and subscribe. Thanks.